It gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce our uh, guest speaker. Uh, Mr. Hammer is coming to us from Columbia, from the Confederate Relic Room and War Museum in, in Columbia. So uh, his, his topic tonight is Fort Mott. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you an evening with Fritz Hammer. Good to be with you. I'm uh, quite uh, pleased to see so many people on a Friday night. Uh, you don't usually get that many people coming to a presentation, so I hope it'll be worth your while. But when I come to speak to groups like you, uh, I always like to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at our institution. And uh, right now we're in the process of putting together a major exhibit on the Vietnam War. And uh, right now I've interviewed about 30 veterans. Um, and the exhibit we're planning to open next spring. And we continue to look for people that might be willing to uh, tell their story if they served there, or uh, it, and or if they have any objects, artifacts that they brought back that they would be willing to have us use in the exhibit. Uh, we'd love to talk to them. And I have some flyers in the back uh, on the table there with my information. If they, uh, if you know someone that's not here that might be interested, to take one with with you and pass it on. But that's my big project that I've been working on now for about a year and a half. But we're here to talk about the American Revolution and particularly about a major small engagement down uh, in Cal what is now Calvin County. Uh, and that is the siege and the Battle of Fort Mott. Now the title I put in here is the Siege of Fort Mott. I probably should have put in there the Siege and Archaeology of Fort Mott because part of my presentation tonight is going to be based on archaeology that folks at the Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University have done over a 15-year period. So I'm going to begin by looking at the history of the, of the occupation of South Carolina, how it led to Fort Mott, and then the battle, the siege and battle, followed by the archaeology that helps to verify some of the history. And as you'll see, the written history on the battle is very meager. So the archaeology has helped tell more of that story and hopefully they'll be able to do more archaeology because all they've done is a sample. So this amazing this painting you may have heard of Mort Kunstler. Uh, he's usually known for his paintings of Civil War subjects like Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee. I think he's even done a few on Wade Hampton. But he did this one of uh, the siege of Fort Mott and uh, Talking to archaeologists and historians who know this battle pretty well, and read the epic, he did a remarkable job of putting this together because it's pretty darn accurate. And as you'll see as we go along and look at the archaeology, a lot of it coincides with what Mort Kunstler did when he put this together. So this is where the site is today in Calhoun County, just above the water, uh, the uh, Congaree River. It was an important location between Charleston and Camden uh, during the Revolutionary Era. And so as we go along, well, you'll get a better sense. It's now just a field. As you can see here in 1909, the Daughters of the American Revolution installed a plaque or a stone monument that still stands there today. And it's not too far from where the actual uh, Fort Mott is located. So, to, to begin with, we have to start with the revolution and what was the situation in South Carolina in 1780. You will recall that uh, South Carolina had repelled the British at the uh, Battle of Sullivan's Island in June of 1776. And for the next four years, things were fairly calm. Uh, until about 1779, when the British occupied Savannah, they sent up an expedition that made an effort to take to Charleston. But the British did not have an adequate uh, force or supplies, and so they had to pull back to Savannah. The, the Americans, with French assistance, tried to lay siege to Savannah, 
and they were finally repelled in uh, 1778. And so, 1779, what's going on here in, in, in the colonies? Well, the British were defeated up at Saratoga Springs in New York in 1777, and the American forces that were in Pennsylvania were sort of facing off the British. The British had failed to take major parts of uh, the northern colonies. And so in 1779, the British developed a new southern strategy. And that was, they believed, based on intelligence they had, that if they sent a major force of British troops into the Carolinas and Georgia, they'd be able to attract all of these latent loyalists that were waiting for them to come out of the woodwork. And so, uh, in early 1780, the British landed a large force of about 5,000 troops south of Charleston, near in the Beaufort area, and they marched overland and laid siege to Charleston. And that was a six, that was a six week siege from early April until May the 10th, when the Americans were forced to surrender. And that's one of the biggest defeats in American military history. Over 5,000 troops were surrendered to the British. And Clinton, General Clinton and his assistant, Lord Cornwallis, thought that they were on the verge of succeeding and taking over the entire southern region with the support that they sought within the back country. So here is Lord Cornwallis. Henry Clinton leaves command of South Carolina to him and, he, and, and uh, Clinton heads back to New York. And Cornwallis, after he solidifies his uh, situation in Charleston, makes a proclamation and tells the entire area, uh, the colony of South Carolina, you must declare loyalty to the king or else essentially you'll be considered rebels and therefore your property and even your freedom will be ended. This proved to be a, a big uh, mistake for the British and helped in a, in a way rally the American cause because in the summer of 1780 it looked pretty grim for the Patriot cause. The British moved in from Charleston and set up various posts throughout the state. Uh, Camden was the biggest center in the interior, and then to maintain communications and supplies to Camden, they built little posts from Charleston on up. And Fort Watt was one of those. Maybe some of you have also heard of Fort Watson, which is in Clarendon County. Uh, it was built on top of an Indian mound, and uh, it's now a state park. If you haven't been there, it's worth taking a look at. So the British are building these posts, and then they can extend it from Camden to a Friday's Ferry, uh, where Columbia is today. They built it established there. 96 was, a mate, was the biggest post in the upstate. Um, and then they had little posts around. And as they were building these, they were trying to bring out the loyalists that they were believed were waiting for them to come. There were a few snags though. One of those we're all very familiar with, and that's Francis Marion. Now, Francis Marion had been the commander of the 2nd South Carolina Line Troops. But they were captured when Charleston fell in May 1780. However, Francis Marion uh, had escaped before the fall of Charleston, and he headed up into uh, the upstate trying to rally any people he could. And then there was an event at the Waxhaws. Anybody who knows the Revolutionary War history probably heard the Battle of the Waxhaws, or the massacre at the Waxhaws. And that's where uh, Bannister Tarleton was sent by Cornwallis after a relief of Virginia troops that had been sent down to Charleston. Uh, and to try and relieve the siege. Well, they didn't get there in time, so they headed back north, and, Char and Tarleton, with his cavalry, was sent skedaddling after him. He met him, 
just south of the North Carolina line in what is now Lancaster County. And it was a, uh, a short, sharp engagement. The Virginians, the stories are very, it's very difficult to understand exactly what happened. But the Virginians claimed that they raised a white flag to surrender. And Tarleton had sent a delegation out to accept it, and the British claimed that some of the Americans shot at them. And then Tarleton said, all right, that's it. We're going to shoot the, a lot of them. Forget the prisoners. Well, many of them were shot down, and uh, that became a rallying cry for the American cause. Remember the Waxhaws. And that helped Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter to rally militia troops to begin to send intelligence north and send little expeditions to ambush these British supply trains that were coming up through the Charleston, up to Camden and beyond. So this began that resistance. We just, I just mentioned the Battle of Huck's defeat. That was one of those early little battles that began slowly to turn the tide of the war. Well, as, as you, if you know, if you remember your Revolutionary War history, Lord Cornwallis left a garrison in Charleston and a small one in Camden after they defeated General Gates at the Battle of Hopkins Hill in August of 1780. And his idea was to keep, was in the fall to start marching into North Carolina to rally more of these loyalists that he thought were there. And then he sent Colonel Ferguson, who was a Scotsman, who had trained a lot of American loyalists into crack troops. He sent him into the upcountry to try to organize some more loyalists. And that's where he met his fate at King's Mountain in October of 1780 where the Overmountain men from Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina coalesced and at Kings Mountain they surrounded Ferguson and virtually wiped out his army and killed Ferguson. So then from there Kings Mountain and there's the Battle of Cowpens in January of 1781. Daniel Morgan faces down Bannister Tarleton and soundly defeats him. That was up in uh, was that in Spartanburg or Cherokee County? I can't remember that. Which, but anyway, it was north of Spartanburg. Uh, that was a major victory. And Cornwallis is befuddled what to do. So what he, he continues into North Carolina with the bulk of his army. And this is when uh, Nathaniel Green is appointed to try to rally American forces and take on Cornwallis. And the biggest battle of, of his early tenure was the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in, in North Carolina in uh, March of 1781. The British won it tactically, but they were severely wounded, uh, wounded, lost a lot of men. And Green, while he had to leave the field, he turned around and he headed back to South Carolina. And that is where Francis Marion teams up with Light Horse Harry Lee. You know, Light Horse Harry Lee. He is the uh, father of Robert E. Lee. He was uh, a crack cavalry commander. And uh, I'll, I'll get to him in a minute. Lord Rowden, he's the commander of Camden. This is uh, Camden's Nathaniel Green, appointed by General Washington to come south and organize the forces against the British. And there's Francis Marion. We're really not sure exactly what his visit is because we have no contemporary portraits of Francis Marion. This is based on some slight descriptions we have. He was a short, angular fellow, but he was uh, very wily, aggressive, um, and he was a thorn in the side of the British from the moment he was able to galvanize his militia in the summer of 1780, and he brought much important intelligence to Green, Nathaniel Green. He relied heavily on. And there's Light Horse Harry Lee from Virginia. He is part of that contingent that is sent down uh, uh, from the north to help uh, galvanize and continue the uh, fight against the British to push them out of South Carolina. 
So he brings some of his regular troops, and he is allied with Francis Marion's militia, and they begin what's called the War of the Posts, which is to take these posts individually and slowly squeeze the British out, out of the upcountry. So the first engagement is Fort Watson, I mentioned to you, on this Indian mound. And the interesting thing about that is the, the tower that the Americans built to look out over the top of the garrison and fire down into it. And after about a week, they were able to force the British to surrender. So they went from Fort Watson in April 1781, and they go about 20 miles to the west to take on Fort Mott, which is the key, which is our main story. So here's Fort Mott. I'm sorry I didn't have a map of the whole state, but you know South Carolina relatively well. You know where Calhoun County is, it's sort of between Orangeburg County and Richland County. And it's right situated on the Congaree River. So the road that went from Charleston up to Cam Camden went right by it. So this was a key strategic location to hold, to hold by the British. And they had come there in the fall of 1780 to take over the area. And Rebecca Mont, who was owner of this plantation, had a, a fairly substantial house that uh, she had moved to after Charleston had fallen. She had, her husband had been quite wealthy, but he had passed away uh, before the, the siege. And so she owned a lot of property both in Charleston and in this area, several thousand acres. We're not sure how much. She probably owned quite a few slaves. And this was the best place for her to be away from the city because she had all the food she needed, pretty good protection. But then the British showed up. And they decided they were going to take over this house and make a stockade out of it, a little fort to protect it. And they sent Rebecca Mott off to a smaller location, uh, kind of a sh probably the first outpost in the area before they, she had built this house. So this is sort of the situation, this is kind of the situation as it stood just before Marion and, and uh, Lee show up. So what do the British have? They have about 180 soldiers. Some of them are loyalists, and others are Hessians, you know, the German mercenaries that the, the king had recruited. Uh, they manned this fort. Now, of course, they didn't all fit into there. They had, they had a camp outside. Uh, we're not sure exactly where it was, but that's where they would be generally until they were put under siege. Then they'd have to all pack into that fort. So Francis Marion and Lee show up and they begin to lay siege with the idea that uh, they're going to starve the British out. And so they, uh, they begin, they, they set up siege lines around and then they dig siege trenches trying to come up close to the fort and take it on. We'll show, I'll show exactly where they are when we get to the archaeology part. Then they, after 10 days, they hear that the British are coming out of Camden to relieve Fort Mott. That's what they think. So they say, we've got to do something quick uh, to take the fort before the British show up. And then we're, because we, we can't handle both, both the ends of the thing, we'll have to evacuate. So they decide, they, they figure out what they're going to do. And this is where the story the myth, we're not sure how accurate it is, but this is the story that's come down to us. The Becca Mott approaches Francis Marion and uh, Light Horse Harry Lee and says, look, I have these arrows. You should fire arrows into the roof of my house and we'll burn the British out. And so that's kind of surprising. This is her home. She's willing to sacrifice it. And that's what some of these uh, loyalty to, to the cause some of these people had. So they begin to they fire arrows into the roof and eventually it catches. The, British, the Americans have a six-pounder piece, 
that's off to the side and fires a few shells. With the fire, the British quickly realize they can't hold out, and so they surrender. And uh, both sides managed to put out, according to the story, the fire so that there's not a whole lot of destruction in the house. Pretty remarkable. This is a 19th century painting depicting Rebecca Mott giving these arrows to Marion and Lee. Again, you have to take, there's, there's a lot of uh, probably license. That's, we're not sure exactly how it happened, but it's an interesting depiction. And here we go back to the, the siege uh, painting of Kunstler, showing you that while it's probably the only thing wrong with this painting probably is the siege lines weren't quite that close in reality. Uh, other than that, everything else seems to be accurate as far as we can tell. So, uh, the, the Americans capture the British, and an interesting story here. Francis Marion is, you know, he's a hard fighter, but once the enemy has been defeated, you know, it's, it's time to forget about all the anger and hatred and treat them as gentlemen. But uh, some of uh, the other side, some of these men were not as uh, magnanimous. And so when they found some uh, militia that were from South Carolina, the Loyalist militia, they decided that they should be executed. And so they managed to hang three before Marion found out about it. When he found out about it, he was outraged. And he demanded that if any, that there would be no more executions and that they all should be uh, treated as prisoners of war. Um, and this is an interesting part of Mary, that uh, unlike Sumter, who seemed to be much more aggressive and willing to take vengeance, Marion was not. And if you read Marion's accounts in the legislature later on, where South Carolina legislature was trying to sequester and confiscate the estates of people suspected of loyalism to the crown, he stood up and argued that they should be given amnesty. That, you know, that this was a war and it was over and now we needed to bring everybody together. And to some degree, Marion succeeded in that venture, not completely, but some. But at any rate, uh, so, Battle of, of uh, Fort Mott, the siege of Fort Mott is over. The uh, Marion and Lee head toward Granby, where the British have another post, which is now you know, where Columbia is, and continue the War of the Posts. And uh, eventually, by the, the, the fall of 1781, the British are pretty much out of South Carolina, except in Charleston. And that's where they'll remain for a year and a half until they finally evacuate the city in December of 1782, and Green and his men march back into to liberate Charleston. And that is really the end of the revolution as it stands in South Carolina. So what's go, what goes on with the Fort Mott site? We don't know very much. Uh, there are occasional visitors that come through there over the years. Here is a drawing of the battery in which the Americans had situated their cannon during the siege. That's its depiction in about 1849, the remnants. Um, so we don't know. We have a few accounts. Uh, Lee, in his autobiography that he publishes in 1812, briefly mentions the siege of Fort Mott and been working with and Francis Marion, although he tends to give more of the credit for the success of the operation himself, not to Marion. That was kind of Lee's way of doing things. He, he was a bit, rather boastful fellow, a little bit different from his son. Uh, so, but the accounts are meager. So in the early 2000, 2004, the Institute of Archaeology began an investigation of the site. They began with a, with a uh, ground survey to see what might be on the surface. And then they did little test pits going down about a foot, foot and a half to see 
because much of this area had been farm land, and so it plowed over and over. So you have a plow zone that would go down maybe 10 inches or so, so that all that earth on that first 10 inches is very disturbed, but sometimes you'll find stuff. So what they would, what the archaeologists did is they dug test trenches uh, in portions of the site that went down below that plow zone, and they began to find evidence, art, uh, uh, artifacts, as well as stains in the ground that can help show you where those siege trenches were that Marion had built. So this is the layout as you saw before. And this is what the archaeologists determined based on the excavating they did. Here is Fort Mott. Here is where these men were and how they began building a siege line towards the fort. And Marion's men were around here. They were the militia. And they were firing at the fort. And when you when the excavations were well underway, they began to find American bullets, uh, round balls. A lot of them were rifle balls. Now the rifle balls, you know, are smaller than the larger round bass of the Charleville, which is the American regular spot. So they would find a lot of these in this area in here, suggesting that that's where Marion's men were, based on the direction of, of the shoe. And then they find evidence of brown bass balls in these areas in here, the British fire now. So after the battle, Lee's uh, engineer, he, this is the one design that he, he made of, of the, uh, the site. This would have been the British Fort Mott Fort, and then uh, these were the uh, trenches built around it uh, where the men would be in. And archaeologically, here's what they found, corroborating what the engineer had, had, uh, had drawn in 1781. Of course, it's not perfect because it's been sitting there for over 200 years. And so this is the kind of material, artifact-wise, that they're pulling out of the ground. Now you say, well, all of this is home. You know, you have uh, pots, uh, remnants of pots, buckles. Well, you've got to remember that this was a domestic home site until the British got there. And then, of course, the British, they would have probably used some of these kinds of things for liquids like rum, uh, water, and that sort of thing. So all of this makes sense to have been there. And they all, this all dates from that period in the 18th century during which the battle and the siege were fought. And then uh, they found a lone cannonball, this was six pounder, and these spikes in the area where the, the American piece of artillery was. Now why they would have left that there, we're not sure. But they probably had a lot of ordnance and some, somehow it uh, fell out, maybe when they were leaving the place. And they may have, it looks like these wrought iron spikes were used to build a defensive emplacement behind which the artillery piece would have been put. And here are the rifle balls. These are larger. And if you have time afterwards behind you, some of you I've told already, there are some reproductions of these. In the back, you can get a sense of the difference between the British brown bass and the American rifle ball. See there, 54, 55 caliber. All of them found in the trench areas where the Americans were trying to approach the tape, find a tape of war. And then, I guess the most romantic, exciting thing in a way found was the iron arrow that was found in one of the trenches, or, or in, in the actual uh, remnants of Fort Bunk. It seems to corroborate the story. Uh, 
And there is a reproduction of that in the back there. You can take a look at it to get a sense of it. That's the only one found. But you have to remember archaeology is very expensive, so you only do sample tests in small portions. It would be nice if you could excavate half of it, but you'd have to have a lot more pool to be able to do that. So they only excavated probably less than 10% of the site. Uh, but in doing so, they, they got enough information to be able to reconstruct a lot. And if they can get more funds to do more archaeology, they'll probably find more. Now that the site is protected, that, that's a hope. And then you find this English half penny, 1772. So it's for a siege, it's pretty recent. And it makes sense. It might have been British or the Hessians may have had it. But of course, it's possible to be an American that would have had it. Uh, because in the colonial era, the, the American colonies had very little coinage. They had to rely on what the British or the Spanish had. And for pieces of eight, well, they were using that at the same time. And there's a reproduction of this in the back you can take a look at, too. So the, that's kind of the history and uh, archaeology. These are Jim Lang and Steve Smith were the principal investigators of the project over its uh, decade of work that they did there. Um, and uh, the, the actual painting the original is, uh, was loaned to us by the old exchange building. Tony Yen's or is the uh, manager of the old exchange building. So that's uh, the story of Fort Mott. Do you have any questions or comments? Both of these, both of these levels were Both of these what? Both of these procedures. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they were in the spring of 1781. Were there any other sieges or battles in that area of the Pacific? Well, no sieges, but near, not far away was the Battle of Utah Springs in uh, September 1781. That was the last big engagement in South Carolina where Rowd and Green faced off. And that's where the, that was the final kind of end of British operations because they got thoroughly bloody. The Americans lost a lot too. But that forced the British, after that, to evacuate into Charleston. And essentially, that's where they were pulled up for the rest of their occupation. He was married in there also? Yes, he was. So he was there all through. Yes. This is not archaeology, it's more history. Even though I've heard the front was what's called Jackson's Point. No, I have not. I've heard that. Uh, I'll have to check. Uh, where, do you know where you uh, heard or read it? I read it. I think I read it in one of the South Carolina publications. Uh -huh. I don't know which magazine. It it's quite possible. It may have originally been known that that area was known as Jackson Point, but I have not heard that. I'll have to check. Thank you. Yes, sir? Can the general public go to the side of the private property? It's, it's, they're, they're working to make it into, uh, you know, they've been preserving battlefield, revolutionary battlefield like Blackstock and Musgrove Mill. They're working to purchase that land and make it a, 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 a preserve. Uh, they do occasionally take crowd people out there. We took a group of about 12 people out there. Steve Smith uh, gave us an overview of the archaeology and where the battle uh, lines were on the actual site. So if there was interest in trying to do that, uh, you know, we could work something out with you if you want to, although we'll do it in the fall or winter. You don't want to do it this time. No fun at all. You, not only is it hot, but there are nice little snakes roaming around and who knows what. And bugs, lots of bugs. But that's an idea if you, if you want to discuss it further, uh, let us know. Any questions or com other comments? Well, thank you very much for uh, your attention and uh, take a look at the reproductions in the back if you like. And uh, I want to come and talk some more. I'll be here for a while. Thank you again. Yeah.